You only have to look around the many lecture rooms to realize the opportunities men and women have in Cambridge of learning their subjects. They have the rare good fortune and privilege of being taught and trained by world famous experts. If it is the physical sciences, there is the Cavendish Professor of Physics, Sir Lawrence Bragg. In this course of 24 lectures on physical optics, I'm going to talk about the interference and diffraction of light waves. I want to deal with such things as uh, fringe visibility and fringe formation, the diffraction of light passing through apertures or around obstacles, the analysis of spectra by gratings, the very important question of resolving power, formation of optical images, and the passage of light through doubly refracting and optically active media. The, the test of the success of any course is not so much what you people are able to repeat in an examination that you take at the end of the course, but what you're going to remember 10 years from now. Oh, there is Professor G.M. Trevelyan, the historian and master of Trinity. I now turn to the political aspect of the cabinet. We must trace its gradual evolution from a private meeting of men who were the king's servants only, as in the reign of Charles II, into a meeting of the king's servants who are also servants of the House of Commons. This change was not a part of the Revolution Settlement of 1689. That settlement had not taken its final form, which we may call the Hanoverian Constitution, until the modern cabinet had been forged on the anvil of time as the iron chain binding the executive to legislative and legislative to executive. Research work goes on endlessly in Cambridge, work which immediately or ultimately affects modern day problems. It may be investigating the habits of wireworms and the best ways of destroying them in the soil, or studying the mechanism by which an animal, such as a snake or a millipede, moves across a small wave bridge and recording the movement on a revolving drum. traditional in Cambridge. In every laboratory there is the most modern apparatus, spectrophotometers that can determine the concentration of pigments in solution, balances that can weigh something as light as the wing of the smallest insect, the electron microscope which has a resolving power 40 times greater than any microscope using light, or the gigantic high voltage installation in the Cavendish laboratories that can generate a million volts. These are some of the scientific instruments which are almost terrifying in their powers of penetration and detection. Undergraduates move from one lecture room to another, punctuated here and there by a visit to a cafe, a refresher in the morning's rush. But the work goes on, surveying in the fields by the river Cam at the back of the School of Engineering, or a drawing class in the engineering laboratories, or next door in the School of Architecture, hearing new ideas and developments in the design of modern houses and public buildings and their relation to town planning of the future. Not far away are groups of laboratories with plenty of opportunities for the student as well as the research worker. There, men with women from Newnham and Girton work side by side learning the proper scientific approach as well as gaining the necessary knowledge for their degrees.
The morning's work in the university ends at one o'clock. By then, the lecture rooms, the museums, and libraries are empty. The undergraduate leaves the university and returns to his college. In a way, he exchanges one life for another, another life no less important. He exchanges the bustle of the university building for the peace of the college cloisters and the quiet beauty of the college courts. It would be impossible for a man ever to forget the stillness of the second court of St. John's, with its buildings of dull, sun-colored brick, or the immense great court of Trinity, where Isaac Newton and Lord Byron lived and worked. The smaller courts of the smaller colleges, too, have their own particular charm and beauty. He will remember the many famous buildings in his own and other colleges, the Peachian Library of Magdalen, the Fellows Building of Christ, the Timbered President's Lodge of Queen's, the Wren Library of Trinity, and the Great Lawn at King's, with the Renaissance Clare, the Gothic Chapel, and the Classical Gibbs Building. Even the River Cam, moving slowly along the backs of the colleges, has its meaning and exerts its influence. It is a part of Cambridge life. The college buildings, the college lawns and the river together form one indivisible whole, the bank. The banks of the Cam are an invitation to sit and work, read and think. It is in this atmosphere that an undergraduate lives his three years at Cambridge. It is a kind of family life with centuries of tradition behind it. It is a life with opportunities for friendship and comradeship where one meets all types of men, where new ideas are formed and old ones discarded or strengthened, where there is leisure not to be idle, but to read, talk, work, and think for oneself. It's a life of contrast with opportunity for quiet and opportunity for play. Discussion goes on endlessly in Cambridge. Cambridge life stimulates it. Everybody does it, dons and undergraduates alike. It is a common sight in summer to see two solitary figures pacing the great lawn at King's, two dons in deep discussion. There's also an easy informality between don and undergraduate when they meet by chance, as they often do, in the college court. The war has played a big part in Cambridge life. Sir Will Spen, the master of Corpus Christi College, was appointed regional commissioner for East Anglia at the outbreak of war. Men coming to Cambridge, unless physically unfit, have to train for the Navy, Army, Air Force and Home Guard. Every college has its own ARP services, manned by undergraduates, and they're very efficient. time Cambridge, you'll often see the Provost of King showing overseas visitors to this country around his college and afterwards lecturing to them informally on his favorite subject of Homer. Why does Greek poetry still matter? First I think because it is the poetry of freedom and of friendship. 3,000 years ago Odysseus cried, what sort of people live in this country to which I have now come? Are they proud and arrogant and savage and unjust? Or are they friends to strangers, men of a God-fearing mind? Friends to strangers. To this day, Greece has only the one word for foreigner and guest. 